every conference he would say, Pastor Mitchell, uh, just in case, he goes, I brought a sermon in case you want me to preach for you. And uh, so that was an ongoing joke. Uh, Dad and I uh, often chuckled about that. But I've always enjoyed uh, Marvin and uh, when I'm fellowshipping with him, when I'm preaching in that area. And so I took him up on it. And so we're going to have, we have the great privilege of having Marvin Wells. He's going to preach for us this morning, preach for us tonight. Let's welcome Marvin as he comes. Mike, too. It's good to be in the house of God. Can I get a witness? I've uh, been asked a number of times, uh, why are you here? What, what are you doing preaching at Prescott? And uh, Pastor Mitchell just began to elude about the story. And if, if you got an hour or two, I'll tell you the story. Uh, for years, I would, tell, I would tell Pastor Mitchell, I got a sermon. If you need me to preach, I got a sermon. And he'd always say, uh, let me see a sermon. And uh, he'd, he'd say, uh, just hold on to it. Just hold on to it. <laughs> and uh, I got a scare. Uh, probably about, about five or six years ago, I got a real scare. Uh, I said, uh, Pastor Mitch, if you need me to preach, I got a sermon. He said, hold on to that. So I'm like, well, all right, all right, hold on to it. He didn't say no. He said, hold on to it. And then uh, I heard over the microphone, uh, uh, Marvin Wells report to the stage. Like, oh, my God. I grab, I grab my sermon. I grab my, uh, they say, uh, are you Marvin Wells? I said, yes, yes. We need you to open in prayer. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. But can I tell you what I believe? As Pastor Mitchell stated earlier, I believe this is the answer to that request. I've got a sermon to preach. This sermon is a long time coming, and uh, I want to tell you something. My theology is correct. I believe that Pastor Mitchell is looking down on this sermon. Listen, if Abraham knew that Moses was back there in Luke chapter 16, I'm sure Pastor Mitchell knows that we in church this morning. Can I get a witness? Can I get a witness? So I'm going to do my best this morning, and I'm going to try to get you out of here before 3 o'clock so you can come back tonight. <laughs> but the reason why I'm here, you can put the first one up. The reason why I'm here this morning, actually, is because 33 years ago, 33 years ago, I was a new convert, and I heard that there was a man coming to, to San Antonio, Texas, to hold a crusade. And understand, I'm a new convert, and so the buzz was going around, hey, Pastor Mitchell's coming to San Antonio, are you going to go? My response was automatically, no, no. I'm like, who's Pastor Mitchell? I don't know a Pastor Mitchell. Does he know me? I don't know him. You know what I'm saying? Uh, why am I going down to San Antonio? And everybody would always say, are you going? I say, no. They never tell me who Pastor Mitchell was. And so word is getting back to my pastor at the time that Marvin's not going. And it said, uh, he said, uh, Marvin, are you going down to the crusade? I said, no. He said, why not? I said, why should I go? He said, because Pastor Mitch is going to be there. And I asked the question I asked everybody else. Well, who's Pastor Mitchell? And then he began to say, well, he's the leader of our fellowship, a worldwide, you know, fellowship, churches. I say, well, great. That sounds like somebody I'd like to go see. And so I go to the crusade. Pastor Ruby is hosting him. And I go to the crusade years ago. And uh, I tell you the truth, church. Uh, I've never heard a man preach like that. Now, when I say I've been in church all my life, I'm not just making that up. My dad's a preacher. My dad's a pastor. I'll tell you about that sometime. Uh, uh, and Church of God in Christ, that's another circus. I'll tell you about that sometime. And I went to hear Pastor Mitchell preach, and he preached on family curses. That was the sermon he preached, family curses. And I remember saying at the end of his sermon, my family's got some curses upon it. We need some curses broken. But that's not the reason why I tell you the story. The reason why I tell you the story is because at the end of that message, he prayed for people, uh, and then he made a statement that I held on to, and he said, anything I have done, you can do. Now think about this. You might not notice this, but I'm black. <laughs> I don't know, I just, want, I just want to put that out there, you know, so, so we, can just, we, can just, we can just get that out the way, you know what I'm saying? So now that we've gotten that out the way, you know, <laughs> no secret giggles or nothing. Okay, I, 
for a black man to hear that, that this white man is saying, anything I've done, you can do. I'm thinking to myself, for real? He's not just saying that, is he? That's not just, you know, something that they say at the end. That anything I could have done, you can do. Because of that statement, I've literally preached around the world. Because of that statement, we have 11 churches out of and under Temple, Texas. Because of that statement, we have a harvester every year. We give uh, our monies to world evangelism. Once we pay off the harvesters, we give the rest. We, as a matter of fact, Saturday night is completely uh, towards world evangelism. Because of that statement, I'm here today. As a matter of fact, when we took that picture there, we're actually in Mexico City. He's doing the Mexico City crusade uh, when that picture was taken. We're laughing. We're laughing because I, just, I had just walked up to Pastor Mitchell and said, Pastor Mitchell, I got a sermon. You want me to preach? I got a sermon. <laughs> and, we're, and we're there laughing. And we're there laughing about that. You know, these guys probably think, man, even in Mexico, this guy doesn't give up. He doesn't, he doesn't relent. But I'm here today because a man's made a statement. Anything I have done, you can do. And I believed it. And I believed it. If you have your Bibles, I want you to look with me in Mark chapter 1. I want to preach a sermon called Dealing with Temptation. I'm not a, I'm not a long preacher because I'm one of the preachers that I like getting out of church early too. Are you with me? I, I, I like getting to the restaurant before the line builds, you know what I'm saying? And so, and so I'm, I'm actually I'm, I'm almost done preaching. <laughs> if, you, if you're visiting, you picked a good day to come to church. You, <laughs> You're going to be, I know you want to jump up and go, yes, uh, but you picked a good day to come to church. Mark chapter one in verse 12, we're going to look at that in just a moment. The year is 1990. And in 1990, the nation of Iraq had just invaded a much smaller nation of Kuwait. The reason why they invaded Kuwait, because Iraq was indebted to Kuwait for some oil revenues that they had not paid. Iraq did not want to pay, and their solution to uh, getting out of debt was, we just invade that country, okay? Now we don't owe you nothing, you belong to us now. And so they invaded that country. But we had a president at the time by the name of George Bush. And George Bush said, that is not right. What you have done, I don't care how big you are, I don't care if you have the seventh largest military in the world, that is not right. What they did to this country is not right. So he organized a coalition of forces. And through this coalition of forces, we were able to build up a, a force that the world has never seen before. As a matter of fact, during this buildup, I was called back onto active duty, if you'll put that, put that up. I was called back to active duty. I know what you're thinking as you look at that. You're probably saying, man, that guy looks good. Yeah, he does look good. Uh, <laughs> if I do say so myself. When I'm taking that picture there, I'm actually in uh, Dahran, Saudi um, I'm outside of, I'm outside of Dahran, Saudi Arabia. I'm actually at a place that we called a log base echo. Don't worry, that's long since be been declassified. I'm at a place called Log Base Echo in support of Operation Desert Storm, Desert Shield, Desert Storm. While we were there, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we had to operate, you know, the, this build up and, and get everything ready for the war to begin to, take, to begin to take place. But on this particular day, we're in the foxhole. Me and my group of men, I'm the senior senior NCO in the foxhole. And it's not like these little square foxholes that you know, only two people can fit in. No, these were actually huge foxholes. As a matter of fact, the Army Corps of Engineers came in and dug our foxholes with front end loaders. And so, I, and our foxhole is actually pretty big. So we're in the foxhole one morning. And uh, we have the, tell you how big the foxhole is. Uh, uh, we have the M60 machine gun on one side of the foxhole. We have the M203 grenade launcher on the other side of the foxhole. And in the front of the foxhole, you have M16s, the, the rifles in front of the foxholes. 
And so I'm the senior non-commissioned officer, and so what that means is, if anybody fires, it's at my word. It's at my word. And so we're there on watch. Then all of a sudden, I heard one of the soldiers say, hey, Sarge, I think I see something. Knowing that it's going to be on me if we misfire or we shoot the wrong person. I said, hold on, just hold on, hold on. One of the other guys said, I think I see it too. So I had to go up to the front, move those guys out of the way. Where are you, where are you looking at? Where are you looking at? And they pointed out to the left. Look over there, you'll see something moving. Now I see it too. I'm like, okay, lock and load, lock and load. But it's not one of these World War II, just slap it in and ram the barrel forward. That makes too much noise. You give away your position. It's actually stealth-like where you lock and load. And then we're there. Just hold your position. Just hold your position. And you can imagine the tension in the place. This is not a game no more. It's not an exercise no more. This is for real. And everything's pointed. And we're ready. I said, at my word, on my word. And then all of a sudden, I got a better look. I said, hold your fire, hold your fire, don't shoot, don't shoot. Because it wasn't the enemy out there. It was rats. You know, when you're eye level, rats look huge. I mean, it was rats, and it was them kangaroo rats jumping around. Now, here we are finna unload on these, on these rats, and we, we got superior training, we got superior fire force, and we got these rats coming to attack us. And then we're like, they start laughing until the rats came inside the foxhole with us. And we're like, ah, ah. Now, we're out there in the middle of the war zone screaming like women. Ah, ah. Nothing against women, but ah, ah. We're screaming. I heard one guy say, it's on my leg. It's on my leg. I saw another guy do it. I said, don't, don't shoot his leg. <laughs> We're screaming like women inside that, <laughs> inside that foxhole. Because of rats. Because of rats. Listen to me. Sometimes we allow the wrong thing to unsettle us. Sometimes we allow the wrong thing to get us out of our normal sphere of operation. And it's not as bad as it seems. It's just a small issue. Listen, regroup. And somebody go step on their ad. I wait over here. Go step on it. <laughs> we won that war. Not because of us in that foxhole. <laughs> we, <laughs> we won that war. And we want it because of an overpowering show of force. That there was just so many people, so many allies, so much. I mean, we, I saw five-ton trucks, tractor trailers full of prisoners of war. We want it because of the overpowering show of force. There are people in this place and I asked God, are they here? He said, yeah, they're here. There are people in this place that you're fighting a battle and you're losing. And you're losing because you have not tapped into that overpowering sure force that God has provided for you. That God has strengths. God has allies. God has things available to you. And you sit there and you're losing a battle when all you have to do is just call on your allies. And it's instant victory. Instant victory. Now, I want you to think about this as we deal with temptation. Are you with me this morning? Oh, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have a great time. Let's read our text. Verse 12. The Bible says in Mark chapter 1, immediately the spirit drove him into the wilderness. And he was there in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan. And then it throws something in there that I was kind of wondering, why would it put that in there? But it says, and was with the wild beast. You ever wonder about that? He's there tempted about Satan, and he was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered to him. We're going to look at that statement a little bit later. He was with the wild beast. 
Temptation is something that everyone goes through but nobody talks about. Temptation is, the Bible says, according to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13, it is common to man. Well, if it's common to man, why isn't anybody talking about it? Who can I talk to about it? Why am I battling this thing alone? No one talks about it. We don't talk to a pastor about it. We don't. Uh, the wealth of resource that he is, we don't pass him dealing with temptation. We don't talk to a brother about it. Hey, brother, I'm dealing with temptation. We don't talk to a sister about it. Sister, I'm dealing with temptation. Because something has formed in our mind to make us think that if we talk about temptation, then we will look weak in front of our pastor, our brother, and our sister. And so we don't tap into the resources and we keep losing the battle. Because one-on-one, -on -one, uh, we're no match against the devil. Are you with me? I know, I know one to chase a thousand, but what if that one is trying to fight 15,000? One-on-one. It's such a big issue, though, that Jesus taught us to pray when he taught us to pray. He said, pray this part to lead us not into temptation. It's such a big issue, but yet no one's talking about it. Therefore, many are not dealing with it, and therefore many are losing when it comes to the issue. Someone said, temptation wouldn't be so bad if it just wasn't so tempting. Why he's tempting? Well, because he's tempting you with the things that you always want to do anyway. You, you know. You, 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 there's, uh, there's something in you that you want to do anyway. Temptation carries with it a negative connotation, and it's a desire to do something unwise or wrong. So let's look, first of all, this evening at temptation follows decision. In our text, Jesus had just made a decision. He made a decision to go down and be baptized by John. He's going to start this ministry, and uh, he's going to go down, identify with John's ministry, and, um, and, and, and before, I, before I do anything, I'm going to be baptized. He made the decision. Immediately following this decision comes an attack. You ever wonder how you can have such a great service on Sunday, and then Monday, like the devil waiting on you, like, hello, remember me? I mean, you could just come out of a revival meeting. I mean, I mean, you've been touched at the altar. I mean, you're at the altar going, oh, thank you, Jesus. And then Monday, the devil says, hey, remember me? Hello. Because temptations follows decisions. His decision was immediately followed by attack of the devil. Good things happen when people make a decision for you. We applaud people who make a decision. You know, at one time, we all made a decision for Jesus. Can I get a witness? At one time, we was the visitor. At one time, we was the new person. And we made decisions for Jesus. And Father, get your 10. Just to show as we made a decision when we were in our infancy, our new convert days, to do something for Jesus. The next day, an old friend called. The next day, an a, a ex called. The next day, an opportunity arose because temptation follows decisions. And the devil knows this, and so he immediately mounts assaults. The devil knows that you've been set free, you've been delivered, you've been liberated. He knows that you're walking in confidence and self-esteem. He knows that you can do all things through Christ. He knows that you're an overcomer and not an underachiever. He knows that you're free from the condemnation of hell. He knows that nothing can separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so he immediately... I've had people come up, get prayed with the Holy Ghost, and they say as they're walking back to their seat, the devil started lying to them. That wasn't you. Immediately after they make a decision, he comes and he assaults with temptation. Jesus is in the wilderness being baptized by John. Imagine the scene. And then there's a voice. John first yells out, behold the Lamb of God. You know, wouldn't you like it? If you walk into church one day and somebody get on the intercom and say, behold, the Lamb of God. I mean, you walk to your seat like this. <laughs> but not only did John say, behold, the Lamb of God, but, but God himself says, this is my beloved son. Which one? 
the one that the light is shining on. It's got a couple of people with the light. The one that the dove lands on. This is my beloved son. You know, we come up out the baptism water, all we get is dripping wet. Nobody saying this is my beloved son. <laughs> Matter of fact, they're probably telling us don't be late for church tonight. You know, <laughs> they probably. <laughs> but God says, "This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased." And then the devil shows up with temptation. Immediately, he's driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. One man said these words, most temptations today start with incognito mode. I just, I just had to throw that in there, you know. There's a very popular, popular song that we used to sing growing up, and it's called Don't Let the Devil Ride. As a matter of fact, uh, my son just brought that song out in our band we played in the 180, uh, Don't Let the Devil Ride. And it says, don't let the devil ride. If you let him ride, he's going to want to drive. Don't let him ride. And he goes on to talk about many other things. But temptations follows decisions. Secondly, I want to look at how God uses temptation. Yes, I did say secondly. You know as well as I know, there's only one more point after this one. <laughs> and that is my longest point. <laughs> I want to look at how God uses temptation. The Bible says it was the spirit that drove him into the wilderness. This word drove means it thrust him, it cast him, it forced him into the wilderness. God is saying, I've got a great plan for you, but before you can enter greatness, you're going to have to gain victory over temptation. Before you enter greatness, now think about this, there's, there's, there's a plethora of things we could do in the kingdom. But it always seems like something holding you back. Yes, God has, I know the thoughts I think towards you, says God. The word of God is yes and amen. The promise of God is yes and amen. But before we do that, you've got to get victory over this. And can I tell you, sometimes most people are, are not like the legion of demons in, uh, in, in, in Mark chapter 5. Most people are like the rich young ruler, when Jesus said, it's just one thing. Just one thing. It's just one thing you lack. If you can deal with this one thing, if you can get this one thing, and, and perhaps maybe even suppose that the one thing is, if we can just get victory in this area, it'll propel you into all that God has for you. It's just one thing. You see, trials and temptations are stepping stones. They're not stumbling blocks. Why do I keep Get tempted by the same thing because you keep flunking the test. You keep flunking the test. You know, the teacher ain't going to give you a test on calculus if you ain't passed the algebra. Don't worry about the geometry. Don't worry about the trigonometry. Don't even worry about the chemistry or the physics. I haven't taken those classes, but I read about them. And so don't worry about all that. If you can't pass the basic math of breaking down fractions, don't worry about all that. The reason why you keep having the same thing is because we're trying to get you to get victory over this one thing, this one area. There are opportunities, trials and temptation, there are opportunities. And there are opportunities for God to make us stronger, for God to be able to do more things with us and through us. Can you imagine this? That if I could just get victory over this one thing in this one area, I could be a pioneer, a missionary, a door director, on the song service. If I could just get victory, I could be in the, in the booth back there. I could, I could, if I could just get victory in this one area, because most, it's not a lot. One thing. And what make it so, make it so, Funny, it's the Bible said Jesus loved him. Are you with me? Talking about the rich young ruler. Jesus, Jesus looked at him and he loved him. I said, so, so can you imagine, imagine this is the rich young ruler. I'll use this as an illustration. Imagine this is the rich young ruler. And Jesus is looking at him, but he's looking at you. And he says, listen, I love you. 
but you're still going to have to deal with this one area. Yes, pastor loves you. Yes, you put a smile on his face. Yes, we're glad to see you, but you're still going to have to deal with this one area. Until you, until you get past this one area, none of this is available to you. You still got to deal with this one area, this one thing. This is why James says in chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of temptation. Why would you count it all joy? Because, listen, I'm going to be stronger after this. You know, I took Spanish in high school. And I could speak, I could speak a little bit. I could tell you I'm hungry. <laughs> I, I could say, let me borrow $20. You know, I could, I could say the, the important stuff. You know what I'm saying? And I took Spanish 1, Spanish 2. And uh, I actually took four years of Spanish, and all I can say is I'm hungry. But anyway, that's another story. <laughs> and anytime I get a textbook, I'd immediately go to the back of the textbook. I'm, I'm there in the first day of class, first week of class, and I go in the back of the textbook. And it, I'm like, wow, this is amazing. By the time this year is up, I'll be able to do this if I just sit here and pay attention, if I just progress through the class. I had an accounting class one time, and the accounting teacher said, listen, if you just come to class every day, I will not flunk you. See, I don't care if you don't pass no test. If you just come to class every day, I will not flunk you. I passed. <laughs> I, I ain't the smartest man in the world, but I can figure that one out. I, I passed. And I go to the back of the book. I say, man, you mean I'm going to be able to know all this by the, by the end of the year? This, this is going to be available to me? Yes, it will. But you've got to go through the progress process. You've got to go through the process. There's so much more available to you if you could just go through the process and get victory in this one area. I want to advise you. Listen, after mountaintops experience with God, learn to get along with God in prayer. Learn to get along with God. Why? Because I know the devil and I know me. God, the reason why I'm in prayer this morning is not because it's Monday morning and it's 7 o'clock and it's time to go to the, to the hour prayer. Because I know me. We had such a good time yesterday that I know the devil's going to try to lay a trap for me. I know me. See, you need to be spiritually strengthened and prepared to follow. Follow through with your decision. See, most of us, we make a decision and we ain't prepared to follow through. I want to close. I know somebody just said, hallelujah. And I want you to consider the wilderness with me. <clears throat> Temptation is a wilderness experience. In that, you're alone. It's not designed to be, but you made it that way. You're alone. As far as people are concerned, nobody knows what you're going through. Even the person next to you don't know what you battled last night. So you're alone as you're going through this. And our text says that Jesus was with the wild beast. In my mind, I'm thinking, um, he's not worried about the wild beast. Why? He created, he created the animals. You know, you see, I, if I was Jesus, I'd say, come out here and get, mess with me if you want to. We're going to be having tiger steaks tonight. Come over here. <laughs> I'm going to be eating spare ribs. You come and mess with me. <laughs> but he was alone with the wild beast. Now, I understand that Jesus had to be tempted upon all points, just like you and I. Just like you and I would. He couldn't use his supernatural ability to get out of sin and temptation. He had to deal with it just like you and I would have to deal with it. The Bible says he's out there with the wild beast. Think about it. How many know fasting hard enough by itself? let alone a lion and a tiger looking at you. It's hard enough by itself. But what are these wild beasts? You ever have some wild thoughts come in your mind? And you're there alone with the wild beasts? Wild imaginations? I know we've got the ability to cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, but we don't. And he's there with the wild beasts. Not only is he battling the hunger and fasting and gone to a supernatural dimension and 
fasting, and, and, but now he's battling these wild thoughts. He's out there with the lions and the tigers and the bears. Oh, my. And they want to devour him. Just like your thoughts want to devour you. And you could be looking good on the outside. Why ain't you coming to church? My mind, these thoughts. Why, 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 aren't, why aren't you progressing? My mind, these thoughts. You're there with the wild beasts. But God wants you to conquer the wild and to triumph and to experience victory. How are we going to do that? In the words of the Apostle Peter, he writes in 2 Peter 2 and 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the righteous out of temptation. The problem is we aren't turning to him. We aren't turning to anyone. Let me, let me, let me ask you, let me, let me inform you of something. When, you, when you're working with somebody and they say, uh, I'm just going through some things, temptation. I'm just dealing with some things, temptation. When I get myself straightened out, then I'm going to come, temptation. That's what they're dealing with. And as the story goes with every temptation, and Jesus began to, quote the words every temptation he'll provide a way of escape but you know what I like about this story here in our text the Bible says then the angels came and ministered to him when in the temptation in the wilderness when he's going through what he's going through then the angels came. And what does that tell you and I? That tells us we don't have to face temptation alone. There's a force of people wanting to help you. If it's common to man, everybody here got to deal with it. My pastor would say, well, how do they do it? How do they get victory? Well, how, how, how do they do it? They tap into the resources that are available to them. It's the enemy that wants you to stay by yourself and, and you haven't learned that by yourself you're defeated. By yourself you're defeated. I can imagine the nation of Kuwait say, hey guys, we need help. We've been overrun. Can we get some Canadian help? Yeah, we'll be there. Okay, we need more than that. Can we get some Australian help? Yeah, we'll be there. Okay, we need more than that. Can we get some help from France? We'll be there. Okay, we need more than that. Until the point where it was such a strong and powerful and large coalition. that the end was decided from the beginning. That the actual war only took four days. Listen to me, my brother, my sister. You don't have to fight this alone. Call your brother. Call your sister. You know what? Most of the time you call, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going to call brother speaker here. This, this is a speaker here. This is my brother. Because I don't want to have to point at nobody because you, you sit out there, you start crying. What are you pointing at me for? You know, not the whole church thing. <laughs> brother speaker. <laughs> brother speaker. Can I talk to you? Yeah, man, I'm battling temptation. You know what brother speaker probably going to say? Man, I was battling the same thing. Well, how'd you get victory? By just talking to my friends. I hate to quote uh, this guy, but I'm just going to go ahead and quote him. Joe Crocker said, I get by with a little help from my friends. Well, yeah, I can say I get high with a little help from my friends, but uh, <laughs> we ain't going there. <laughs> I get by with a little help from my friends. You may know some of my friends. One of my great friends, pastored, not, he's not, he pastored in China, just left uh, wonderful work there in Foshan, Guangzhou, Guangzhou, China. His name is uh, Patrick Johnson. There are times when I just call Patrick up. Hey, man, what's going on? Hey, man, I'm dealing with this issue. And 
you know, I mean, sometimes, you know, you don't, you don't want to hear your advice. You know what I'm saying? He said, well, Marva, what would you tell me if I was you calling you? I say, but you ain't me. So, <laughs> what would you say, though? Ah, oh, yeah. This is what I say. And there are times when we talk and we have not solved the world's problems, but we feel a whole lot better. Because I've tapped into that resource, that overpowering sure force that allows me to get victory. Sister, call a sister. Just call him up. Hey, how, how you doing? I'm doing fine. First thing, they're going to know something wrong because you called. But, so, but, but just call him up. Hey, you know what? These thoughts are running through my mind. You know, I'm glad you called. You know, my husband and I, we've been married for 30 years, but about 10 years into our marriage, we had to deal with the same thing. And how, but how did you do it? And, and, and you're stronger because now you've got an overpowering show of force and the devil has to flee now because you've just got victory. There's an overpowering show of force available to you. I want you to bow your head. Every head bowed, every eye closed. We're talking about dealing with temptation. It's something that's common to man. Everybody goes through it, has to deal with But nobody wants to talk about it. Why? Because they might think I'm weak. They might look at me differently. I might lose my job, my position. Well, if you still hold on to it, you're probably going to be ineffective in it because you've not dealt with this issue, this area. Listen, this morning, you don't have to be a victim. You can be victorious. God's got greater, but you've got to gain victory here. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond that which you're able I need to conduct some kingdom transactions before we open the altar. There are people you're going to be set free. There are people you're going to be delivered. There are people your lives are going to be transformed. But the most important people in here right now are the ones that don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The ones that are not forgiven of their sins. And I'd like to spend some time just talking to them just a few moments. At one time, I was the visitor. In that church in Colleen, Texas, back in 1987, I was the visitor. I had no plans of staying. I had no plans of joining them. I was just being kind and courteous because somebody invited me, and I said I'd come. But that day, as the preacher preached, and as he said, heads bowed and eyes closed, and the invitation went forth. God began to deal with my heart. I was destroying my life with alcohol, destroying my marriage, newly married, only married of two, two or three months. Alcohol is so bad that the sergeants in my company would come up to me and say, hey, soldier, you got a problem with alcohol? Knowing that I'm about to destroy my career because if I said yes, I'd be removed out, put in rehab, and that black mark would follow me for the rest of my career. And there's some opportunities that wouldn't be available to me, but I was destroying my life, destroying my marriage, my family. Didn't know what to do. And that day, as he said, is there anybody who would like to give their life to Jesus? I didn't give Jesus much. But the little I had, I gave to him, and he changed my life. Today, Jesus Christ wants to change your life. He wants to set you free. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you can honestly say if you died right now, heaven be your home. If you want that change offered by Jesus Christ, no one looking around, I want you to slip your hand up, put it right back down all across this place. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Forgive my sins. Raise it high so I can see it. I need Jesus. Maybe you're backslidden. You want to come back to Jesus. Slip your hand up. Put it right back down. You're tired of living a lie. Who else? Others. There, there are others in there. 
There are others in here. You need Jesus. You picked a good day to come to church. Jesus wants to help you. Not saved or backslidden. Raise your hand high so I can see it. We just want to pray. We're not going to put you on the mic. not going to embarrass you. Just going to pray with you. This was the beginning step that I made years ago. Now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed with no one looking around, if you raise your hand and you're sincere, I want you to do so. I want you to slip out of your seat right now. Meet me at the altar. Just come. I saw a hand over here. Just get up. Slip out of your seat. Maybe I didn't see your hand. Maybe I didn't see your hand. I need a worker right here to help me right here. But you say, I need Jesus. Slip out of your seat. Just come while these are praying. Just slip out of your seat. There's a God in heaven that loves you. If he can love a man like me, he, if he can forgive a man like me, and, and you got the polished down version. It was much worse than this. One thing, church, if we can gain victory here, the gates swing open wide. And all this becomes available to you. If we just deal with this issue, if we just deal with this issue, stop living these secret lives and incognito lives and nobody knows lives. And I preach in a lot of churches. I don't know about the protocol, but I'm going to do it this way. I want us all to stand. Just stand to your feet. You're in this place. Just stand to your feet. Just stand to your feet. I know you might not be used to me. I'm not used to being here. I want to open these altars. You want to find a place to pray. Just slip out of your seat. Come to the altar. Find a place to pray. Dealing with temptation. Just because you come, that don't mean you're dealing with the issue. You might want to come and pray for me and pray for my church. You might have some other issue of your life you want to pray for. The altars are open for you to come find a place at the altar to pray. And if you're at your seat, you can be seated. If you're at your seat, you can be seated while these pray. If you'll just give us a little time, we're going to sing a song while these pray. We're in no hurry. I worship you in spirit. I worship you in truth. Make my life a holy praise unto you. If you're at the altar praying, pray as long as you want. We don't want you to come to the altar and then run you off. Stay there. Talk to Jesus. Do business with Jesus. Don't leave the same way you came. Don't go back the same way you came. Leave it at the altar. Father, I pray for these, God, that are bowed before your holy throne, God. God, I pray a supernatural enabling, a supernatural deliverance, Lord God. God, we come before you asking right now, God. God, that you take away the weight, God, the condemnation, God, the sin, Lord God. That God, help us to reach out to others, Lord God. God, to begin to tap into those resources, God. I bind foolish pride, God. God, move by the Holy Ghost upon these, God. God, breathe a fresh anointing, God, right now, God. God, breathe fresh fire, God, upon them, Lord God. Move by your spirit, God, in Jesus' name. Have your way, God. God, we don't want to be the same, and we know through Jesus. Jesus, we are not going to be the same. God, we glorify you. God, we thank you. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Listen to me. Um, before I turn the mic back over, I want to pray for anybody that's suffering from a migraine headache. You're dealing with, or any kind of headache, migraines or headaches. I want to pray for anybody. Is there anybody you identify yourself with or uplift your hand? I want to just pray and believe, believe God. Anybody. If I'm not seeing somebody, Make it known to me. Okay, sir, we, we want to pray for you. Did I miss anybody? Did I miss anybody, this man here? If you're done praying, you can stand right where you're at at the altar. But don't think I'm rushing you. Don't think I'm rushing you. If you're done praying, you can stand right where you're at at the altar. Sir, can I talk to you for just a moment? And this is for anybody. Maybe somebody's watching live stream and you raise your hand and you're saying, this is, a, this is an issue. This is an issue I'm going through or an issue I'm dealing with. When you come to the issue of migraine headaches, okay, listen to what I say. Most of the time there's a conflict of life. You're dealing with the conflict in life. Uh, God wants you to go left, but you want to go right. God wants you to go right, but you want to go left. There's a conflict in life most of the time. And a lot of times when you're dealing with the issue of migraine headaches, you're dealing with guilt. You're dealing with guilt. Maybe I've done something that I just can't forgive myself for. 
uh, I, I don't know why I made that idiotic decision, but you're dealing with the area, you're dealing with the area of guilt. I found you get rid of the guilt, you get rid of the migraine. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you, okay? I want you to pray this. As a matter of fact, the whole church is going to help us pray. When I pray this prayer, will you help us pray, church? Just repeat with me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I ask you now to forgive my sins. As you forgive me, I forgive those who've sinned against me, who's violated me, who's hurt me. I set them free. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to set me free from the guilt and the actions that I've committed. I walk away from this place set free in Jesus' name. Father, I pray right now, healing and deliver. Satan, the blood of Jesus be against you. I bind right now any of 